Welcome to APTN Investigates Retrospectives. I'm Beverly Andrews. Museums in Canada and across the world house thousands of Indigenous remains and artifacts stolen during colonization and settlement. Some were taken to be studied, while others were taken as trophies or souvenirs. In one well-known case, the skulls of two Bayatuck individuals were taken to Scotland. By 1809, the powers that be are aware that the Beatic are going to be gone soon. They pay people to try to capture a Beatic uh, and for the means of befriending them. Somehow our ancestors, whether intentionally or not, uh, exterminated another group of people. I'm 68 years old and I've heard those stories all my life about the Beatic people and what happened to them, about the uh, grave robbing that took place. Their spirit of the Beatic people not at rest. You've got parts of their bodies scattered all over the world. And to me, that's, uh, that's sickening and it's disgustful and it's disrespectful. In 2016, Todd Lamron brought us the story of those skulls and the long fight to bring them home. This is Extinction Event. It's our fault. We bear the burden of guilt in the way that the modern day Germans bear a burden of guilt for the Nazis. Because whether our ancestors did it deliberately or turned their backs and allowed it to happen, either way, we're at fault. To think that a distinct people are totally wiped off the face of the earth. It's a crying shame that uh, it came down to that. They were driven slowly from Conception Bay to Trinity Bay, to Bonavista Bay, to Notre Dame Bay, and then inland. Damaswit lived at least part of her life on these shores. And because she was captured in that month, she was given the name Mary March. It was the European name. It was a European name. And they're the ones that... Anne Moore is a retired school teacher. She gives a reading from a book her grade two students wrote. So Nona Sebastian called to his wife, Demasdewitt, to come and help. Demasdewitt hauled on Nona Sebastian. Nona Sebastian pulled and yanked on the mammoth bake apple, but the bake apple would not budge. She says the kids inspired her to learn more about the Beothic. Okay. War takes us on a tour of Grand Falls, Windsor. She remembers a student's report about the museum where her mother worked, wondering why it was named Mary March. And in the report that struck me when I was reading it, she, she mentioned how beautiful the name the Mazda was. She was. She was upset about that because she didn't think anybody should be able to Change, change somebody's name, take their name away from it. War insists on bringing a carving of Damasdwit to this spot. It overlooks the Exploits River. And this rock out here is named after her husband, Nana Sebastian, who was the Beothic chief. And he got killed trying to save, protect her and his newborn baby. That's why I brought the, the carving of Damasdwit down here, because really, the Mazdewit and non Sebastian belong together. Mark Roberts and Danica Lewis are teens now, but 10 years ago they were in grade two. They're here to recite a class project. Dear sir, my name is Danica and I'm seven years old. My name is Mark and I'm eight years old. Thank you for taking such good care of the Mazdewit and, and Nas Nana Sebastian skulls for almost 200 years. Can you send them back, please? I think it's time for them to come back where they belong. We are trying to change the name of the Mary March Museum to the Damasduit Center of the Founding Peoples. They would be nice in the museum. Your friend, 
Mark Roberts. Your pal, Danica Lewis. Whenever the opportunity arises, war still schools people on Damasduit and on a Sabasset. He got killed trying to protect Damasduit and the newborn baby. And our kids at the school, grade two kids, they tried to, remember, they tried to rename the museum Damasduit Center of the Founding Peoples after, after Damasduit because Mary March was her given name that the, the Europeans gave her. So you're familiar with John Payton? Oh, yes, John Payton. Because John Payton is the one that killed Nona Sebastian, right? Or to be more precise, this man's father, John Payton Sr., and two other men killed Nona Sebastian. In 1819, the Paytons lived on the Bay of Exploits, near present day Botwood, Newfoundland. By that date, conflict between settlers and Beothic had become increasingly common. Archaeologist Lori McLean takes us on a short hike to help explain. This was one of the last places they called home along the coastline. They were able to hang on here relatively late, I think, because Europeans weren't interested in this area until after 1750 when they began to push inland to, uh, to uh, pursue salmon. Unlike most groups in Canada, the Beothic refused to trade with Europeans. There was very little economic cooperation between Beothic and Europeans in Newfoundland, and certainly not enough for the Beothic to, to survive. McLean runs the Beothic Heritage Foundation in Burnside. Inside, it's full of artifacts. It's fairly good workmanship. It's broken right now, so we can't see what the uh, stem looked like, but with these shoulders, it looks like it's a pre-contact example. After 1750, they stopped making stone tools. And one of the big reasons they, they, they switched to iron, it just might have been easier to get. Instead of bartering, Beothic would simply take iron tools and implements and rework them. After the moorings were cut on one of his boats, Peyton Jr. petitioned Governor Charles Hamilton in St. John's. He wanted permission to recover his property from the Beothic, and Hamilton agreed. But Peyton also had another motive, a cash reward. By the 19th century, by 1809, the powers that be are aware that the Beothic are going to be gone soon. They pay people to try to capture a Beothic uh, and for the means of befriending them. On March 1st, 1819, traveling up the Exploits River was an expedition of the Peytons and eight men. Their destination, Red Indian Lake, the last known home of the Beothic. Albert Taylor knows the lake well. He was born on its shores in Millertown and became interested in the Beothic when he read about them when just a boy. But I became totally fascinated by the Beothics at that particular time and done a lot of poking around, you know, as a, ch as a guy roaming through the woods and everything else. He spent decades looking for sites he heard about. It's just interesting to go to these places and just to think about the Beothic were here. Taylor shows one place in particular. He says Peyton and his men spent the night here. And when he talks about a gully which he made his men sleep in, this is the only gully like this anywhere on the eastern end of this lake. And there they slept till sometime early morning, three, four o'clock. They left and went up the lake and surprised the Beothic. What happened next on this lake in 1819 was reenacted in the 2006 documentary, Stealing Mary. The Beothic woman is captured. The chief is dead. Soon after being captured, Damasduit was taken here to St. John's. She lived in the governor's house during the spring of 1819. She caused a sensation in St. John's society. Someone wrote about her in the local paper. Is it not horrible to reflect that at the very moment, while we sat down at our firesides in peace and composure, many of her countrymen, in all probability as amiable and interesting as this young woman, are exposed to wanton cruelty? By then, you know, uh, Newfoundland uh, has realized that, you know, the Beothic are going to be gone, right? And there is, you know, there's a genuine attempt to to stop, to stop their oncoming extinction, their approaching extinction. 
Governor Hamilton hatched a plan. He sent a Mazduit back to her people with an expedition to be a peace envoy. And that summer they searched for the Beothic. But their canoes always disappeared behind a rock. Or they'd vanish into the woods. Or their dwellings, called Mamatiques, were always empty. When they uh, captured Mary March and killed her husband, they also killed their best hunter. And there are those who conclude that that was the beginning of the demise of them. The Mazduit was dropped off here in Twillingate, no closer to being reunited with her family. Captain David Buchan was put in charge of the search in September. He moored his ship in this body of water, now called Peter's Arm. De Mazdwit was brought here from Twillingate by none other than Peyton Jr. in November. But there was a problem for Buchan. She was already very sick with tuberculosis, but he was determined to bring her back to her people. Around this point of land is the mouth of the Exploits River. Buchan was to travel with De Mazdwit up it to Red Indian Lake. However, on January 8, 1820, she died aboard ship at the age of 23. Uh, she was waiting for, you know, she thought, you know, some, at some point in time she would go back or they would come get her or this would work out. She wouldn't just wait for the rest of her life, but that's what happened. And that to me is most, it, that's such a personal tragedy. I dreamt I saw a woman standing by a strand waiting for people to come in off the land, waiting there for seven days with a fire in the sand, waiting for people to come in off the land. That to me is the two most evocative verses because that is what happened to her, you know. She came to St. John's and waited and then she got sick and she died. But uh, there's no sense in the narrative around her that she thought she was the last of them or she thought she was the lone survivor. He wrote the Mazduit dream because he'd always been fascinated by her story. And much of Newfoundland history had been immortalized in song, except... There was nothing written about the Beothics. I think because everybody honestly is a bit ashamed of it. Somehow our ancestors, whether intentionally or not, uh, exterminated another group of people. Captain Buchan kept his promise and brought the Mazduit's body back to Red Indian Lake and put it somewhere on the western shore. Placed her in a, in a coffin, she had a shroud, uh, et cetera. They had, there were some grave goods interred with her. And it remained there for seven years, until William Cormack came along. He was one of the guys who started the Beothic Institute in 1828. Cormack walked across Newfoundland twice in 1822 and 1827, trying to find the remaining Beothic. So he was very interested in the contacting Beothic and, and saving them at the time. Cormac found signs of the Beothic, but not the people themselves. And then he stumbled across a burial hut. And when, when Cormac found it, the Beothic had built a new structure around it, right? So the Beothic had altered the original setting then. Cormac's discovery was dramatized in the 2006 documentary, Stealing Mary. There were two skeletons wrapped in deer skins, two adults, then there was the coffin, and then there, there seen, we think there were kids there, it says. We think there were children there, and there were grave goods. Cormac brought De Mazduit and Nona Sabasset's skulls back to Scotland for study, where they've been ever since. Chief Mizzle Joe is proud to show off his community. This is the new part of the reserve here when we're on now. This wasn't a part of the old 1870 reserve. It's a Mi'kmaq First Nation situated at the mouth of the Con River. A dozen years ago, Chief Joe briefly sat on the board of the still existing Beothic Institute. During discussions, I learned that uh, the skull of this uh, lady was taken, not just one skull, but two skulls were taken by Cormac in 1827. He learned they were now in Edinburgh, Scotland, under the care of the Scottish National Museum. Chief Joe asked if they could be brought back. 
and uh, I got a cold reception and uh, from that and um, so I stayed in the back of my mind for a long time and uh, keep talking about it and wondering about it and I helped him to make drums finally two years ago really he traveled to the museum to see the skulls he had them laid out in a small room uh, maybe half the size of his office and a table and they had a white cloth put down and they had uh, the skulls put onto the white cloth he performed a sweet grass ceremony over the skulls more to calm his nerves than anything else he says and it was a, kind of an emotional moment. I'm 68 years old and I've heard those stories all my life about the Bailey people and what happened to them, about the uh, grave robbing that took place. And, and all of a sudden to be in the same room with those remains and uh, have that history flashing in front of your eyes, you know, it's... While in Scotland, he asked how to get the remains back. Uh, we need uh, the process of having the federal government uh, make the request to have the remains turned, returned to Canada and it had to go to a national museum. A national museum like the Canadian Human Rights Museum in Winnipeg or the one in Halifax or four in the Ottawa area. I think those remains should come directly to Newfoundland and once they're in Newfoundland then I think uh, between all of us, us and government, we, we should decide what we want to do. The spirit of the other people not at rest. You've got parts of their bodies scattered all over the world. And to me, that's, uh, that's sickening and it's disgustful and it's disrespectful. When I left grade two that year, I was remembering that we never got the skulls back and that was like so disappointing to me. It's not really part of Scotland's history, so it's not really much reason to keep them there. That and well, the Beothics were here their whole lives. It's only right for the skulls to be back in their rightful place. They should be buried in a special place, and, and like almost like a, a, you know, like a little tomb, and like people can go visit. They won't see them, but they know they're there. McLean says that reburying the remains takes away a potential research tool. Conscientiously store them in an environmentally controlled setting in a university or a museum, whatever, and all that, and not have them on display, uh, not even have them, not even have them easily accessible to people and stuff, you know, uh, but just have them available for, for proper, carefully structured research. I think that's only another token of respect, as much as repatriation is. Ultimately, Chief Joe would like to see a reunification. It would be just simply incredible to be able to unite those, those skulls with the remains that's here on the land. Is it possible to find where Damaz Whitner people lived, let alone their remains? I did a job a couple of years ago and we were looking for that site. And uh, now we might have missed it, you know, we did, but we, we checked 23 locations along a six kilometer section of that northwestern shoreline and, uh, and the work that we did found nothing. Uh, nothing of archaeological significance anywhere. The Exploits River was dammed in 1927 for hydroelectric power. A lot of people would tell you that the lake has grown a lot. It's eroded severely since 1927 when the dam was built on the mouth of the river there. But Albert Taylor doesn't believe Beothic sites are underwater. He thinks they live farther back in the woods. So he believes this site is of cultural significance. Around this site, you're now... And it fits the profile of cobblestone walls. We are of the assumption, because of what we dug out so far, we are of the assumption, we never got time to do it this year, but it's something that needs to be done, that that cobblestone wall will come all the way in here. And out again. If he's right, perhaps Damaswood's family uh, lived right here. Over. Taylor takes us to another place he finds intriguing. Is what I call Cemetery Point, and this is the profile of it. You can see an area here, no large trees. Taylor speculates on why no trees are growing in this oval shaped clearing. For that interconnecting root pattern not to be available onto a circular area of this size in different places had to be disturbed by somebody. 
Damasdowit's niece, Shauna Deethit, drew this map of Red Indian Lake. The markings here are thought to be Damasdowit's final resting place. It corresponds roughly to this location. Taylor wonders if the rest of her remains are here. If this is a location, mm -hmm. okay, if this is where the coffin ended up, there is a breastplate which shouldn't be difficult to find if you got the right technology like brown penetrating radar. He could be right. I don't think he's right. There might be something there, but I, like I said, I've looked along there and I didn't find anything of archaeological significance along that section of shoreline. The rest of her skeleton may lay at the bottom of the lake or has returned to Mother Earth. Regardless, Damaswood has left a legacy for Newfoundlanders. Where Beothic is, is a bastardization of our phrase, Bidagawa. If Mi'kmaq artist Jerry Evans looks familiar, it's because he played this part. You'd be pissed too if somebody was going to take your, take your girl from you, you know? And uh, you're going to end up being shot in the back. So yeah, I was pissed. <laughs> but he also remembers another emotion during the shoot. I guess I got into it and I, you know, I, I, I cried I, right there and then, you know, I, I couldn't help but uh, get over, over, overwhelmed. Jeez, everybody was crying and the crew was crying after they said cut. Being put in those shoes, you know, and uh, getting uh, almost a first-hand view of, of, from that perspective of what they went through, what they, yeah, what they went through. Wondering what the Beothic went through is a common theme in Newfoundland. Just one example. You can go to gift shops all around Newfoundland and find books like these. The Newfoundland Beothic, Termination of a Tribe, or Death of a Race, a Newfoundland tragedy like no other. The word tragedy is overused, you know, usually anyone dies now it's a tragedy, you know, but this was really was a tragedy. It was, uh, it's almost Shakespearean. They uh, were shattered by disease. So the people that, you know, the, the explorers of the 1800s encountered weren't a thriving community. It was the last survivors of an apocalypse stumbling around the woods, you know, trying to hang on. After 200 years, the skulls of two Bayatuck individuals were finally returned. How did you feel when they made their way back to Newfoundland? Well, it's an incredible feeling. Uh, the night that they arrived in Newfoundland, uh, there was quite a crowd of uh, politicians and Aboriginal leadership there. It was a, a spiritual moment, uh, thinking back on when I first saw the remains and thinking about the 200 years that they'd been gone. Yeah. I could feel the presence of something that wasn't, wasn't there before. 